one, and I'm so thankful that you all were able to make it this morning. It looks like we have quite a few people here. We have some overflow over here and then back in the chapel if you feel uncomfortable sitting in the sanctuary, but we do have some space here. First of all, I want to thank my nieces, um, Brookie, for doing the scripture reading today. She thought she was just going to do one verse, and I told her she had to read nine verses. So <clears throat> thank you for doing that. And to also my niece, Blakely, and my kids, Carson and Cadence, for singing, and as, um, particularly my wife. She has been such a trooper. She uh, flows with me throughout the whole week as I prepare my, my sermons. And um, she says, what do you want for music? And I don't give her what I need until like Wednesday because I'm, I'm still kind of thinking things through. And she's able to pull together some amazing things. Last night she was up till 1 in the morning um, preparing a song that I asked her to do, um, courting out the music. She um, just listened to it on YouTube. And she create, recreated the entire song for you this morning. So she's gonna, you'll get to hear that this, um, at the end. Um, I have some visitors here. I want to um, just do a quick shout out real fast to uh, Daniela, who is an old friend. We've known her now for 12 years. And she has been traveling around. She's gone through some things. And I just want to thank her. She's here in church for the very first time. So um, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And it took the Holy Spirit um, working in her life um, through a lot of trials to get her into a place where she can come into the church um, and, and discover God. So thank you so much for, for being here. Um, <clears throat> I want to also, I have some, some thanks before I, I, I get into my sermon. First of all, I want to thank my brother, um, Major Marlo Anderson. He um, has been with me through this whole lecture, doing all my illustrations with me. He did a big battle scene with me last week. Um, he's not here today because he has been infected with uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. And so we need to keep him in prayer. Um, as a matter of fact, the um, Arizona Army National Guard, the um, entire chain of command has gotten infected. So we're praying for, for them um, in the central command. So he's not here today, but I have asked another brother here who has served to do an illustration with me. He doesn't know what we're going to be doing. I said, just wing it. Just trust me. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. Um, also, I want to thank um, a lot of those um, individuals who I've been working with putting my lecture series together. For example, uh, Dr. Goldstein from the um, John Hopkins University. I want to give a shout out to the University of Amsterdam, the University of Cologne, as well as the Central University in Tel Aviv, Israel, who right now is enduring a massive flood and an unseen tornado they've not seen ever. So look on um, the news. Some weird things are happening in the Middle East right now. So I want to thank all of my partners who helped me put together all my research for this lecture series. Um, before we begin, I'd like to just go ahead and start with another word of prayer to just invite the Holy Spirit here. Let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, we're just so grateful that you can call people together like this in the midst of a pandemic and study your word without the fear of um, a pandemic being infected or, or being in a place where we can be free to worship. Um, we know there are places around the world where they're not able to get together, and so we're just grateful for that freedom right now that we have. We pray now for your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that will come into our hearts to open and broaden our minds, to see the application of what we're going to talk about this morning very briefly as we conclude the Christian armor. And Lord, help us to see the relevance in our walk right now, but not only now, but also what we're about to face in the near future. Father, thank you for hearing this prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. So if um, you're joining me for the very first time, we've had a fantastic time looking at the Christian armor. Now, how many of you have actually seen or heard or, or watched a videotape on the Christian armor? Right. Okay. So the majority of us have. It's a, one of the most common themes. However, when we read the Bible, it seems to me like Christians are satisfied just looking at it from a cursory standpoint. We read the words, we take it in, and we say, okay, that's awesome, and then we move on. Well, what we have done over the last eight weeks is we have really stopped and considered what did Paul see when he was in prison in Caesarea Maritima along the coast of Mediterranean when he started to get inspired by the Lord about how our Christian walk is going to be. And later on, when he was transferred to Rome and he sat in under the Praetorian Guard um, um, prison, right there in the emperor's prison, God inspired Paul with a unique metaphor of what we are to face in the final days. And he said, I need you to write down something because those who will live in 2020, 
who will endure some crazy things that we've never endured before. And 2021, if you think 2020 was bad, the Bible is very clear that things are going to get worse. So, so if you think that things are going to get a little bit better, I'm praying that things, and I hope that things get better. But if I am a Bible student, if you are a Bible student, you know from Matthew 24 and 2 Peter that things are, you've just been given the warning sign. It is now time to get your life right with the Lord. Because what is to come in the future is going to be far worse. And so God told Paul, write down what my people need to know for the last days before I come. And so in the metaphor of the Praetorian Guard and the Centurion Soldier, God start, started to teach us what we need to have to endure and how we can stand when we are to face the enemy. Now, when you think of enemy, you think the IRS. You think other people. You think your employer. You think maybe your husband or your wife or maybe your children who don't respect you. Or you're the neighbor who keeps calling the homeowners association on you. Okay? You think those are your enemies, but it's very clear from our scripture reading this morning and what we've been studying for the last eight weeks is that the real enemy is unseen. The, the real enemy is Satan. And it's not Satan acting alone. It's Satan and all of his demonic forces. Now, if you think that the demonic forces and the evil angels are just a few, let me tell you that Revelation tells us that Satan was so influential that he drew how many of heaven's angels? One third. That means that probably for every individual that lives on the planet, there's one evil angel that is hounding you. But I have good news for you. Because Satan only took a third of the angels. That leaves how many good angels in heaven? Two-thirds. That means for every one bad angel nipping at your heel, there are two good angels that are keeping them at bay. And so it's important that we constantly remind ourselves that the life that we live on the planet is not a life that you only see, smell, and touch, things that are tangible, but that there is an unseen thing that is happening that is just as real. Now, this morning in our Bible study, we talked about how when you look at the universe through different lenses of light, it looks totally different. So if you look at the universe through the lens of the x-rays that are coming through, you know the universe looks different through your eyes because x-ray light is different. If you look at some of the pictures that the Hubble telescope has taken beyond the visible light and taking a look at gamma radiation, the universe looks totally different. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. And that is wipe the slate clean on what you think you know because you have based what your knowledge is on what you see and what you hear and what you've been taught. But rather, I want you to now pull back the curtain from all the tangible things you see and hear and look at the invisible world that God needs you to see what is really happening right now on the planet. <clears throat> now, the Christian armor that we discussed is more than just cool armor. This is the centurion guard that would have watched and guarded over Paul in Caesarea, Caesarea Maritima. When Paul was transferred over to Rome, he was under the guard of the Praetorian Guard. Now, you notice that they are, they are completely two different things. And what you see in the last several weeks that I've been talking is that Paul saw that there was a true evolution of a Christian life where when you learn about God, when you learn about Christ, when you give your life to Jesus, you start to armor up looking like a Praetorian or looking like a Centurion Guard. You have the, the, um, the, um, the breastplate with all of the segments in here. What you don't see, what I showed you a few weeks ago, is all of the inner workings on the inside of the breastplate signifying that it is Christ working inside you. You see the awesome armor on the outside, but it is Christ's righteousness working inside of us. All the buckles and the leather and all the things that it takes to keep it together. But when you evolve into a relationship with Jesus and you become the elite guard, you no longer need the segments. What you see is the body of Christ, that six-pack, the cool pecs, right? Now remember, who is seeing this? It's not you, it's Satan and the demonic forces. So when you go into the last days, don't go out there naked. Make sure that Satan sees the armor of God. Now, someone asked me, because I set this up at my home, 
I had several people come in by the neighborhood. They were amazed at the, at the, and they said, is that how tall the Roman guards were? Okay, well, in Italy and Spain, they were about 5'10". So they would have stood about right here to me, okay? But you remember when the, when the Roman legions went into the Gauls and the German tribes, those people were big Scandinavians. They were six feet, six feet two. So they were maybe not seven feet like this, but they were pretty tall. But let me tell you that the sword of Satan can get anybody. Doesn't matter how tall you are. So what we learn in the Christian armor is not so much about the armor that you have to wear, but so much the, about the tactics of Satan. Here is how Satan is going to get you. He's going to attack your eyes. He's going to try to slash what you say. He's going to try to attack your ear. This is how Satan likes to work and deviate us from a relationship with Christ. What you see, what you hear, and what we speak. And so God says, put on the helmet of salvation that you can withstand the strikes of Satan. But we also discovered a unique part of the helmet. We notice there is a back piece. You see that back piece right there? To protect the neck. Now, I mentioned several weeks ago, was that just to, you know, keep the sun from coming in and burning my neck, you know, like when we go out farming and we don't want to get too dark? Is that what that was about? No, because he discovered, the Romans discovered that the Germanic tribes had these massive swords and they would take the momentum of the sword with one chop. And what was their goal? Their goal was to come around and decapitate their head. God says, don't let Satan remove your relationship that you have in that salvation power of Jesus. So protect your neck, keep your head about you. Now, here's the other thing. You notice the plume on top. The Praetorian Guard had a more awesome plume. You see that? That, don't, that had two purposes. One is so that way you looked taller. The other is so you looked more menacing. The other is those who were following you could see where their captain was. If you're going to put on the helmet of salvation, make sure that if you're going to talk about Christ, that others see the plume of Christ and not you. Amen. Now that has weight. So when you turn your head, the momentum of the plume automatically turns your focus to salvation. You see that? And you notice here on the Praetorian Guard, there's something unique about it. Every Praetorian Guard had a victor's crown about it. God tells us that when we give our life to him, that we at the end in heaven will be given what? A victor's crown. And so Paul looked at that and he said, as I evolve myself from a centurion soldier in Christ, eventually I receive a victor's crown and I become a part of the elite. But that's not the only way Satan attacks. We also know that Satan attacked where? How we breathe. So he, Satan will try to attack our, our breathing. Most importantly, our desires, our heart. But you notice here, he can't penetrate. He'll attack with our passions and our, and our, our appetites, our propensities towards all the things that are carnal and pleasing. This is how Satan attacks us. This is how he tries to attract us. And so the way we keep ourselves from following down that pathway that Satan wants us to do as he says, remember that you have a breastplate of Christ's righteousness. That in spite of the fact that you are dealing with all these things, put on the righteousness of Christ. And you notice here that they also wore the robes. The robes of righteousness that had the insignia of the emperor. So always remember that when you go into battles in the last days, that you are clothed with the righteousness of Christ, that you have the breastplate of righteousness, that you can withstand what Satan is going to attack in how you breathe, how you desire, and how you feed your appetites. Always focus on Christ. Give it to Jesus. And Satan cannot penetrate. No matter how hard he tries, he can't penetrate. Now, one of the things that Paul saw was this evolution of Christianity. Though your sins be like scarlet, you will be made white as snow. And the centurion guard always wore red, but the praetorian 
always wore white underneath. Then we discovered the belt of truth. Now, was the belt there to keep his pants up? What was the belt for? This was called the Caliga Militare. It represented the Via Romanus, in other words, the way of the Roman, all of the virtues of Rome. And as you achieve things in, in the Roman way, you would get a brass metal fitting. The more brass you had on there, the higher status, the higher rank you had in society. And military wore it constantly to show how they exemplified the way of the Roman. Well, Jesus says that if you are going to wear the belt of truth, make sure that you're wearing the virtues of Jesus Christ. It is not your own virtues that is going to get you into heaven, but rather the truth of Jesus and his virtues of love and mercy and forgiveness. And that is what keeps you secure, girded. Now, why is it important for the belt? Because those of you who are athletes know that when you are doing weightlifting, you're putting on a belt so that way you secure your core. It helps you secure your balance. So as Satan tries to attack you, how are you going to get your balance? How are you going to be able to withstand Satan as, as he's coming at you? You have to put on the truth of Christ's virtues. Secure your core. Bunker down and take it. Now, the great thing that I really love was the sandals of peace. Now, you remember the sandals of peace weren't these open-toed little things that you are so used to seeing on movies. The, the, the sandals were called the Caligae. Caligae had a, a piece of it called the Manibus. So they were called the Caligae Manibus. And so there are two strings. Whenever the Roman soldier would walk regular, it was open. It would freely move through, and they wore wool socks, right? Lamb socks. When they had to go to battle, they would take the two strings and they would yank on the two, and it would take the Manibus and close them up and pull them in into a prayer position. It would make it a complete boot. It would anchor their ankles, and it would, it would protect their feet from thorns, and they can now climb mountains, they can go down ravines. Now, this is an important spiritual truth, because in your life, you're going to be going through things that are going to be tough. You're going to have to climb some mountains. You're going to have to go into some dark valleys. But when you are doing your travel, make sure that you pull on the strings of Christ, the manibus, close up, and then you can now walk through this territory having sandals of peace, knowing that you can survive anything. Peace is what we want today. Peace is what we don't have. But you can have peace when you go to Christ and put on his peace. Now, what was interesting about those, um, the Caligae, was on the bottom were metal studs called hubnobs. It's the same iron that crucified Christ on the cross. They took Roman iron nails and nailed them to the bottom to create spikes. And so when a Roman soldier would kick, what did, the, what did the enemy see? They saw the nails on the bottom. When Satan coming at you, and you are standing firm, and God says, kick, huh, make sure that Satan sees the nail scars of Jesus. And you can say, I have peace, not because of my peace, but because of the peace that Christ has given me. I am solid, I am secure, I have my, my, my spikes in, and if God says, kick, don't just stand there and take Satan attacking you. Kick and make sure that Satan sees that you have peace because of what Jesus has done for you in your life. Don't just take what Satan is giving you. This is the problem with Christians today. We just take it. We say, oh, okay, God's going to protect me. And you don't do anything about it. If you see the attack, move out of the way. If you see the attack, get on your knees and pray. Wow, that rhymed. Someone write that down. That's a song. <laughs> and then we discovered the shield of faith. Now, the shield of faith is the first um, defensive weapon that is, is meant to be used together with others. And so we discovered that when Satan comes at us, and um, you remember that the word that he used for shield was theos, meaning door. And Jesus says that I am the door. So it was very clear that when Paul was talking about putting on the shield, he says, make sure that you have Jesus in front of you. Now, a lot of times, each of us, right, when we're dealing with um, attacks, 
we can actually shield ourselves and we can get behind it like my son did. I would never, I love my son. I would never do anything that would harm my son. And yet I put him behind the shield. I took a sword and I hit it so hard it bent the sword. Not because I had faith in what my son can do, but rather faith in what the shield can do. Therefore, don't put faith in what you can do. Put faith rather in what Jesus has already done and what he can do for you. Do you see the parallel there? Now, the important lesson behind the shield is that as you're taking it on, there are some people who are just learning about Christ. And they're given a shield too, but they don't know how to use it so well. So shields are meant to be used together. All right, so let me get two kids up here. All right, come on up, you two. You two. Okay, son, you can come up here too. Come on up here. Okay, now these are my two, these are our three good students. They've been coming to my lectures for the last several weeks. Okay, tell, tell everyone your name. Jaden. Jaden and? Wyatt. Wyatt, and this is my son, Carson. Okay, you remember what to do with this um, shield? Okay, hold the shield. Okay, let's put the small guy behind it first. Okay, okay, good. Okay, Jaden, hold this one. Okay, Wyatt, you get the, you get the buckler, okay? All right, now, you see these three friends right here? I'm Satan, and I'm going to come at them. But the guy who I want is Wyatt in the back. Who's standing between me and Wyatt? <laughs> this is how we're supposed to act in our Christian life. When you know that someone else behind is being attacked, don't stand there. Protect your friend. This is the message of the shield. Okay. I want Wyatt. Hey! Do you see what they did? They went into the Tertusa. They did the turtle shell. So they, one stayed on bottom, the other one went on top. Oh, I don't like the fact that these three are standing together. I'm going to come around and I'm going to take out Jaden. Right. Protect. Okay, now I'm going to get closer to Wyatt. You see how they move? This is how we are to act in our Christian life. Don't just stand there. Move with the situation. Because Lucifer, Satan, is going to try different ways of getting you. Let's take out their feet. You see that? I'm going to chop their head. Perfect. Good students. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> he says that's heavy. Whoa. Okay, good job, guys. Good, good students. Now, the thing that we learned beyond the shields was that we were introduced to the first offensive weapon, and that was the sword of the spirit. Now, the different swords, the, um, the centurion had two. He had a dagger. And you remember the dagger had a built-in sharpener. So as you pulled it out, did you hear that? So this thing was really sharp. Every time you pulled it out, it was sharp. Keep the word of God sharp in your mind. But you remember that when we in, in analyze what the word of God is, it's not just the word of God. It's also your testimony. So you have to take your testimony using the word of God now you have a quicker, faster gladius. You can move it. Now it's not just chopping. You can slice. You can do all kinds of moves because the word of God with your testimony means nothing unless you know how to wield your, your sword. How do you know how to wield it? You wield it by thinking about all the times that God has come through for you. And when you think about the times where you could have died and yet you're alive. All the times where you should not have been able to pay your bills, and somehow you paid your bills, and then you match that up with scripture. I will never leave the forsaken or the righteous forsaken. Right? Ask and you shall receive. Now your, your testimony combined with the word of God becomes a fast-moving, quick sword, like Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says. And so Paul says, together with your testimony... With the word of God, you have a powerful weapon. 
But you remember the sword that he was actually referring to was Damascus steel. Damascus steel is taking a weak metal and combining it with a hard metal. In other words, we have to become one with Christ. And we become a beautiful work of art. Faster, stronger. This, this sword here, if I were to go battle to battle with this one here, this is about eight pounds. This is only about two pounds. If I clash metal with this, this sword will break this in half. Because this is about 100 times more hard and more flexible. Now, if you haven't seen what Damascus steel looks like, it looks like water because it's layered over constantly. All the oxygen has been pulled out of the weak metal. In other words, you have to die to self and take on the virtues of Christ. And only when you can do that, then you become a beautiful work of art and more powerful. Look at the difference. And yet, this one will beat this one all the time. So if you want to come up and take a look at this, you need to look at it because I had the special made. So please look at this. Now, the word of God is extremely powerful because of your testimony. And when we read the, the um, Christian armor, and we're, we're so excited about it. And this is kind of where we stop and we say, wow, I can see how in the last days Satan likes to attack us this way. And uh, we, have to, we have to be able to defend ourselves. And we have to stand there and make sure that we can survive until the second coming. That's kind of what we've been talking about. And remember, Ephesians says that this is for people in the last days. So if you have your Bibles, let's just look at this. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. And, and uh, let's, let's take a look at this now for the last time about the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, again reading from verse 10. So the final word, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So right away, we're told that we are to be strong not in ourselves because we, we think we know it all. We think that we study and we have all the answers. But here we see that right away, in the end, be strong in who? The Lord. And in the power of whose might? His might. Put on the whole armor of God not just a piece of it, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, and then we read that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against all of these dark powers in unseen places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you can not attack, but to be able to stand. Now, this is an important point, because a lot of times we, we like to think of ourselves as, as putting on this armor, and now we're ready to go to battle. It's time to just go out and let's just make some war. Right? If I was younger in my younger days, I'd say, all right, it's time to kick some butt. Right? But I'm a pastor, so I'm not allowed to say that word. <laughs> okay? So here we, we think, oh, we're going to get really aggressive. But according to the Bible, it says, don't do that. Stand. Don't go looking for trouble. Don't go looking for it. Just stand because God will be there to be there with you. And don't worry, trouble will find you. Trouble's going to find you. Y'all can relate to this, right? Anyone here not have any troubles lately? Okay, I like to know anyone who has had no troubles. I like to see your life. Maybe I need to walk in your pathway. Okay, it says here, stand, having girded your waist. So we talked about the truth, the breastplate, the, the feet with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts. And, and you saw that day when I took my darts and I blew all those darts at, at my son and they, they were just exploding on the shield. In fact, so much so that fragments went off over into the fourth pew. And this is what's, what Christ can do for you. He can take all of these horrible things and he can deflect it. And then we see here in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication. And here we come to the part where we say, okay, that's cool. Let's, let's go on. Let's talk about something else. And they stop there. Today, I'd like to introduce you to the forgotten piece of armor. The forgotten piece of armor is actually found in verse 19. We never talk about this, but take a look at it. What does its first by saying? It says what? 
Pray. Pray always with all what? Prayer and supplication. You know, mankind is unique, really. Let me, just, just indulge me for a second. Let me just explain to you why I think why we're such a unique race. Do you know of all of the created worlds that God created? Humanity is the only created world that was created in his image. You see, we were meant to show God's love when Lucifer was saying that God was not a love. We were created to exemplify the goodness and the greatness and the glory of God. When Lucifer was saying that God is not fair. And what we don't realize and what we have forgotten as a race is that when Jesus comes again and we go to heaven, that you and I are going to be holding a very special place in heaven. Did you know that? Did you know that of all the places in the universe that you can live, God is going to have his capital city where we are? That Jesus himself is going to be with us? And that when people come to Jesus, the Son of God, he's going to look like you and me. And even when we're crying to the Lord, and even when we're saying, Lord, 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 why, why, why? We have to remember that like a good parent, God will provide water, cookies, or anything that will make my daughter be quiet. <laughs> well, what I really love is this. You see what my wife is doing? Those of you who are watching online don't see, but my daughter's crying over here. But what did, what did Angela do when Capri started crying? She picked, him, she picked her up, and now she's doing okay. You know, this is what God does to you when you pray to him. He picks you up, and he coddles you, and he soothes you, because that is your dad. The father is like a real father. He's our Abba. He's our dad. Made in our own image, or we're made in his image. But what is that? Is it physical image? Is it spiritual image? Or maybe it's all of that. The ability to create and procreate. The ability to transcend ourselves and think of ourselves from a third-party perspective. That's what makes us unique, is that we can stand outside of ourselves and see ourselves from a third-party objective standpoint. And we don't do this enough. And so here we notice that there is another armor piece that Paul could not grasp his mind around in terms of a metaphor. Because when we look at the army soldier, when we look at the Praetorian Guard, we have pieces that we can relate to salvation and the, and the difficult concepts of peace and righteousness and faith. But when we talk about prayer and supplication, what is that? Because Paul knew that we are at war. We're in a battle. And, and, and throughout the, all of the universe, as this battle is going on, we're stuck in this battle place. How do we, what's this thing that we have? Well, now, in 2020, I have a new metaphor. Something that Paul didn't have. So let's, let's just expand our mind for a second and let's look at the metaphor of the other piece of armor that you cannot go into the last days or the next several months or the next year without. And that is communication to central command. Because the soldiers, when they're in the battlefield, in the foxholes, guess what they're doing? They're sending communications over to central command and they're asking and requesting for the cavalry, or they're asking for supplies, or they're asking for more guns, they're asking for more weapons, they're asking for more help, or they want to be extracted. We're at the extraction point. So Paul couldn't figure out how to, how to say it, but now in 2020, we have communication pieces. So let's, let's just try this out, and let's see how this works. So I have with me Brother Mike. Brother Mike is on my committee for emergency response and disaster Okay, so you, you and I have not practiced this, but we're gonna, we're gonna try this out. Your central command, okay? Now, here's what prayer is like, okay? You don't see central command, you only see me. And I'm holding in my hand a little piece of equipment with a little antenna here, powered by a battery. And yet, somehow, I can send my voice through this little piece of box and someone somewhere is going to hear me. 
Pearly Gate, Pearly Gate Central Command. This is Echo 5. Echo 5, come in, please. This is Central Command. This is Stonewall 1 speaking, and I am here for you. What is your name? Awesome. Awesome, because now all of a sudden I'm not in this battlefield alone. I have someone watching my back. Uh, Pearly Gate Command, um, yeah, I'm, I'm under heavy fire and um, I need some reinforcements. I'm at the, um, at the pickup point and um, I, I need you the rendezvous point here and I'm waiting for you to come with that, with that um, Black Hawk. Can, can you give me an ETA on that? ETA is about three minutes. Uh, you can pop smoke in about two minutes. Pop and smoke? That's awesome. You mean to say I can visually let God know that I'm in need? You see, you see what happened here? I told him who I was, and I told him my need. The response back was, okay, three minutes, just hold on, wait. When I'm near, pop the smoke and let me know where your location is. You see, likewise, when you're in battle, don't go into battle just waiting there. You got to get on your knees and you need to pray. Now, how do you pray? See, as kids, we we're, were told that the way you pray is like this. You have to fold your hands. You have to close your eyes. And you have to get down on your knees. And you have to say these words. Our Father in heaven. Um, uh, I can't remember the words, but holy is your name. All right? This is how we pray. Or you're at your, at your dinner table. Our Father who art in heaven, thank you for this food. Um, Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub. In Jesus' name, for all who stand, amen. Right? I'm thinking of National Lampoon, however they said that. Okay, how is prayer actually done? Does it matter where you do it? Yes. No. Prayer can happen anywhere. Does it matter how you do it? Like, do I have to hold my hands like this? Do I have to close my eyes? No. You know my best prayers is when, I, when I'm driving on the I-10. I'm closer to God driving these freeways than anywhere. <laughs> That's right. I'm driving these freeways. I'm saying, dear Lord, just help me get to that place. And my eyes are wide open, and I'm even saying the words. Driving, wherever you are, swimming. Take, you know, another good place for a prayer is in the shower. In the shower. You know, I come up with my best ideas in the shower. That's a bad image I just gave you. <laughs> but but when, you're, when you're under that water and it's relaxing and you're praying to the Lord and, and all of a sudden you get these ideas and, and then you cut the shower short because you, you, you need a paper and pen. And then you say, I'm going to get back in the shower. Then we get some more stuff. What's my point? The point is, is that pray constantly. So the, so the text says, pray how many times? Always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Okay, let's finish off this one here. Pearly Gate Command, thank you for sending reinforcements. Um, I need an ETA on when I get to get out of here. Over. Thank you, Central Command. I uh, can't wait till you're here and I can go home. Uh, you got that turkey roasting for me? I got the leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give Brother Mike a round of applause. <laughs> now, I want to I show you something about prayer and supplication. Thank you, son. You know, when you think about prayer and supplication, you ask yourself the question, is there a difference between prayer and supplication because it's, it's curious that that Paul would use both words in this text why didn't he just say pray always why did he say prayer and supplication so let's see here now my wife brought up my bag so let me get a a pen here and I just want to give you a little insight into the differences of prayer and supplication and here's the thing a lot of people think prayer is just this one-way communication with God um, but I want you to see what the actual word for prayer is. So let's take a look at that. So prayer and supplication. So I want you to think about what are the differences between prayer and supplication. Now, I know some of you are going on Google right now and you're trying to see what the differences are. So before you get to the answer, let me show you the Greek words for this. So the word that Paul used for prayer is a word that's called prosukis. Prosukis. 
Now, prosukis is very different than the word that he used for supplication, which is adiosios. What are the differences between prayer and supplication? Now, this is where I ask you to, to wipe the slate clean for a second, because I need to show you what was actually meant by prayer in the New Testament when Paul was talking about it. Because I think that through the last 2,000 years, we have assumed that prayer is, is sending a message request to God, like God is some Santa Claus. That we could just ask God for like a laundry list of things that we need and want, and God is somehow going to miraculously... Um, my sister-in-law, Heather, who's here today, had a good analogy. Sometimes some people think that God is like a genie, where, where you rub the, the magical lamp in a very peculiar way, and all of a sudden God comes out and he, he gives you your three wishes. Is that how God in prayer is? No. So let's take a look at the biblical teaching of prayer. Now, this is really important because, remember, we're talking about the Christian armor. What does prayer have to do with the Christian armor? We're going to get to this in just a minute. So what does prosukis actually mean? So look at the actual meaning of prosukis. It means to exchange ideas. Did you ever think of prayer as speaking to God like you're exchanging ideas with him? You know, Isaiah says, come and let us reason together. This morning in the Bible study, we said, don't just take any word like you heard and say, oh, that must be the gospel truth. No, you can go to God and you can start to have a dialogue with him. You can have an, an exchange with him. And through scripture, you can discover what truth is. So prosukis meant to interact actively with something. So it is an active exchange and interaction of ideas. That's what prayer is. That's what prayer is. So when, when, when Paul said, make sure that when you radio to central command, that you're saying who you are, you're identifying who you're speaking to, what your needs are, what, what your status, your situation is, and exchange the idea, you know, where's my Thanksgiving turkey? It's coming. What's your ETA? You know, it's a dialogue that you have with God. Now, how is that different from diesis? All right, now here, this is really enlightening. The actual meaning of diosis means to feel a deep personal need and then requesting. What is the difference between a need and a deep personal felt need? A felt need is when you've been through an experience and you discover that you don't have the ability of meeting that need. Do you know what I'm talking about? The situation is dire. You have no way of understanding how you're going to get out of that situation because it might involve another person and that person's not acting the way that you expect them to act. So you have a personal need. It's a felt need. It's something that's impacting you personally. And so Paul says that in that unique supplication, when you're presenting your re request, that personal need, it says to do it at all times. And the word for time is kairos. Kairos means at the opportune. So opportunity at the moment. In other words, don't wait to try to find the answer yourself. Take that felt, that felt need and instantly give that to the Lord. Quickly, get that need quickly to the Lord and God will start working on it for you. Do you see that? So Paul says, the last piece of the armor is pray always at all times because at all times Satan is going to be attacking you. He's going to try to take what, out what you see, what you hear. He's going to try to influence your desires, your passions. He's going to try to take you out at the bottom. And when your shield of faith is wearing down and you have no one else to watch your back, and your sword is getting tired because your testimony is getting tired. Radio in, help. So he says, pray always. 
at the opportune time, at that moment, requesting your felt deep personal needs and have an exchange, an idea, and an interaction with the Lord. Now, I'm going to illustrate to you the power of prayer. Because what is prayer? A lot of times we think that prayer is just simply, you know, we just, in our mind, we just magically throw up a thought into somewhere and that somewhere it goes somewhere. Right? We don't know how, what it is. Okay, well, let's take a look at what it says here. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in what? In the Spirit. In the Spirit. Now, I'm going to give you this text because we're running out of time, but um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to give this for you to write down. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? I want you today to read Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Romans chapter 28, verse or, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27 says that when you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit takes that, that thought in your head and it translates it with your, with, as if it's a groaning and gives it to God. And because he's a part of the Godhead, God understands that need that you just sent up in, in, trans, in transmission through the Holy Spirit. When I was radioing Brother Mike, you didn't see the words float through the air, and yet somehow he got the communication. In a similar way, that sound frequency wave is you sending a frequency wave of request and need to God. You don't see it, but yet it's happening. And you say, well, I don't see it, so it must not be real. Well, you didn't see my communication go between me and him. You just heard the voices, and yet it still happened. And so, so we see that the Spirit is the transmission line that takes our prayers into heaven. Then I want you to look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. This is Jesus speaking now. Matthew 26, verse 41, Jesus says that when you're praying, pray with the idea of being watchful. Watching at all times. Because here's the thing, your prayers are going to be dependent on how Satan is attacking you. He's going to attack what you see. He's going to attack your, your heart, your passions. So those are the things that you need to pray all the time, being watchful for how Satan's attacking you. That way you can give those special requests to God. Be specific. This is what Jesus is saying. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Now this is one that I think that we all need to read. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Because I mentioned this during Thanksgiving to somebody. But I want to read this out loud for all of us to hear. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Now, all these texts that I'm giving you are key texts. Write them down, mark them in your Bible, keep them with you. Keep them with you in your bug out bags, okay? <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Be what? Anxious for nothing. nothing. How many of you are worried about the future? How many of you are worried about the politics of America, about the economy? How many of you are anxious about your jobs or anxious about how you're going to put food on the table? The whole world is anxious. But God says, be anxious for nothing. And everything by, how does he say it? Prayer and supplication. He uses the same two words again. He says, by prosukis and deseos. He uses the same words that he used in Ephesians, again here in Philippians. So he says, by prayer and supplication, but now he adds a new one. What does he say? With thanksgiving. We just had thanksgiving. Here's the problem today. We want God to answer our prayers, and when he does answer our prayers, we forget to thank him for it. All we want to do is say, God, give me, give me, give me, give me. Give me, give me. As soon as you get it, and as soon as you make it, then, oh, yeah, life is cool again. Who's God? I, I don't even know if God exists. This is how we are as humans. I don't know what the problem is with us. You know, God keeps answering our prayers, and yet we keep doubting whether he exists. Because we believe we did it all ourselves. We had the education. We, we got that promotion on our own. No, God says, for everything, prayer and supplication, but also with thanksgiving, knowing how God had answered that prayer, let your requests be made known to God. And so all of this is related to Ephesians chapter 6. And again, I come back to this point. How do I know it's actually happening? Did you know, I'm going I'm I'm to close out here with an important point, and that is this. Did you know that this armor here, this armor here is useless 
without prayer and supplication. You can go out there with all of this stuff, but if you don't power this up with that invisible force field, if you don't power it up and connect it all down and get you surrounded, you're still going to be attacked by Satan, and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna have our time. Now, to illustrate this point, I have with me a light bulb, basic little light bulb. Did you know that within each of us, we have the, the chemical, the electrical, and magnetic properties? You don't see it in me. You don't see me with this stuff. And yet, I have the power to pray to God and send a communication through my thought, through my mouth, and I have the energy within me so powerful to send it across the universe into the throne room on the back of the Holy Spirit. And that same power is enough power to light this light bulb. Now, I'm going to walk around. You can see I have no AC wires, DC wires connected to me, right? And yet I can take this light bulb in prayer. And I can say, Lord, I want to put on the armor of God. And with that, I can light the light bulb. I have the ability within me, the power and the capacity within each of us in the image of God to get on my knees and pray, Lord, I need you right now. And you have the ability and the power to send that communication just like a CB radio directly into the kingdom. And without lighting the armor of God, this armor is nothing. You have to do everything that you need to do to get on your knees, get in, in the mode with Christ and in prayer and supplication. In these last days, when times are getting bad, and let me tell you, times are going to get really bad. There's going to be more people offended. There's going to be more riots, more protests, more social unrest. There's going to be an economic disaster that's going to force everyone to be in a position where you cannot buy or sell unless you fall to your knees worshiping a false image. And in that day, you need to have your armor and you need to be in prayer and you need to say, Lord, let me shine the light that you have given me. You see, we don't even know who we are. We forget that we are powerful, that we are victorious and God has given us the ability of doing things that you cannot see and we take for granted. And so with this, Paul says, what is the final thing for me? that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of what? The gospel. There's people today who feel like they're helpless. They are hopeless. They're out of control. But the gospel, the good news, is that Jesus is bringing salvation. Wrap that around your head. Oh, Lord, I'm shameful because I don't feel like I'm good enough. Look at all of my, my propensities to sin. I'm addicted to pornography. I keep drinking. I keep doing this and this and that. And Satan keeps reminding you by poking at your desires and trying to stop you from breathing. He wants to hit your heart. Get on your knees because the good news is that Christ's righteousness envelops you. The good news is that God gives you righteousness. Oh, Lord, I don't know what to do. I have no peace. Look at I have no, I have no truth. I look at the media. There's nothing out there I can rely on. There's something you can rely on, and that is the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He died. He resurrected. There is a God. How can we forget that? Every historian from Roman to Jewish to, to Christian historian have all validated the authenticity of Jesus Christ, and yet we doubt. You can have peace. We have no peace today. Assassination in Iran. All of the, the unrest that is happening, it's going to happen in the future. But Jesus says, the good news is that I give you peace. That passes all understanding. How do we get that peace? In prayer and supplication, let your light shine. You are more than who you think you are. Jesus sent his son, God sent his son to die for you. And many of us do not want to share the gospel because you're ashamed. You don't want, you don't want to do anything about Jesus. You don't want to tell your story because you're afraid that you're going to be seen as some Christian crazy person. You know what I say? So what? 
let the people know the good news, the gospel of peace, just like, Peter, like Paul did. Pray for all of us that in these last days, even though we're under the attack of Satan, we've seen his tactics, I've shown you how Satan is going to attack, that the best way of meeting those attacks is spreading the gospel. The gospel of salvation, the gospel of righteousness by faith, the gospel of faith and the word of God and peace, all of these things that you, we can have, God says that you can, you can have and you can share with others. How many of you here today are willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? Amen. As Angela sings this song, I want each of you just to shut your eyes and I want you to make a commitment if this is your desire to spread the gospel of the kingdom, God will give you skills and talents to do the things that he's called you to do, whether it's working for kids, whether it's working for the homeless, whether it's working in, in your work environment. Make that commitment now because days are short. It is time to go home, guys. Time to go home. I don't want to be on this planet anymore. I want to see Jesus come with my own eyes, don't you? So let's proclaim the gospel. We're an anchor for those who are hurting. We're a harbor for those who are lost. Sometimes it's not always easy bearing Calvary's cross. We've been ridiculed by Every moment his hand has held mercy for all the love that he's shown all my life. A simple thanks doesn't say how I'm feeling. I get tears in my eyes. So as for me, I'm going to keep on. I'm willing.
Father in heaven, you have given us these metaphors of some big concepts, faith, salvation, righteousness, truth. At the end of the day, Lord, we realize that we're nothing without you. And we have the good news in our own lives, Lord. You have worked in our own lives and with our testimony combined with the word that you have given us in the Bible, we can spread the gospel of peace, the gospel of salvation and righteousness because, Lord, you don't want anyone lost. And so, Lord, those who are watching, those who are here today, if there is someone who wants to dedicate and, and consecrate their life to you, Lord, you know their heart. We pray that as they say, Lord, take me as I am. And I want to have that peace. I want that salvation. Lord, I pray that you will bless them and fill them with the Holy Spirit and that you'll bring them to a place where they say, Lord, I want to make, have that commitment. I am not ashamed of you because you are not ashamed of me. So, Father, I pray for all those who are hearing, all those who are watching, that as we face the, the future, that we can face it boldly, knowing that we will be given a victor's crown, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have already done. And we have faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you all salvation, righteousness, faith, truth, and peace. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen.